We're going to go ahead and get started. I wanted to welcome everyone this evening to the webinar. I am your moderator and your host, Dr. Lauren Levine. Uh, we have just a massive turnout tonight, uh, of course, based on the speaker. I, I expected nothing less. We had close to 1,000 people registered. Uh, a lot of people are here. A lot of people are logging on right now. I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping for a few minutes, uh, and then we'll get to the, the, uh, the meat of the webinar. Uh, as always, I, I, the way I've been starting this off for the last 18 months or so, I hope everyone's staying healthy and, and safe. Uh, Thought we were kind of out of the woods back in July, and apparently we're not. So uh, hopefully uh, this is the last wave, but uh, uh, we got our fingers crossed. Uh, as always, I, I also commend you all for being here this evening. Um, even with all things going on in our, in our country, uh, most of you uh, haven't forgotten the need for ongoing dental education. And uh, uh, you know, kudos to all of you for taking uh, an hour, hour and a half out of your evening to, uh, to join us. Uh, we, we appreciate it. Uh, I, like I said, I'm only going to speak for a minute or two. I want to make sure that uh, Dr. Kaczynski can speak for as long as he wants. Whenever we do these webinars, there's typically about, you know, we have usually have like 900 to 1,000 people. There's usually about close to 100 that have never been on the webinars in the past. Uh, so this is directed more towards them. Everyone else, you know, your old hats, you've done this before. But when it comes to asking questions, uh, we want to make sure we, we, we leave time at the end for questions. We don't do verbal questions, which is obviously impossible with a thousand people on. It's all typed questions. On your screen, you have a GoToWebinar control panel. You type in the questions. Uh, I am going to do my best. I, I say this every time I do these webinars. I'll do my best to get to as many as possible. We are absolutely going to be done uh, an hour and a half. You know, we have got a hard stop there. So. Um, I see the questions as they come in. Sometimes I'll combine some. Sometimes, you know, I can, you know, some of them are, have already been asked. So I'm going to do my best to get to as many. If I don't get to your questions, I apologize up front. The questions are all sent uh, to Golden Dent, our sponsor. Uh, and if there's anything specific, uh, you know, they can follow up with you as well. In the next few days, look for a couple of things. First off, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, a link to the recording typically goes out within a day or two. Uh, I'm not sure if Golden Den puts them on YouTube or how, how they send them out, but you'll be sent a link so that you can download it and, and watch it at your convenience. So don't worry if you, know, you can't wait, wait to the end or uh, you, know, you get distracted. Uh, we, we do have a full recording. During the webinar, Dr. Kaczynski is going to be demonstrating a few products and systems that, that he uses which are exclusive to Golden Dent. Uh, I've been working with Golden Dent for a number of years doing these webinars. I am so appreciative of their sponsorship. Uh, anyone that's ever done a webinar, you know these are not, they don't, you know, they don't form on their own. You, you need a lot of help. You need someone to design the invitations and get them all sent out and handle the CE forms and the recording and all that stuff. And there's no way we could do it without them. So, uh, and of course, if you don't know who they are, you're going to know more about them this evening. Uh, one thing I can say is they really do have that, that commitment to, to ongoing dental education. Speaking of Golden Dent, uh, I always get emails after the webinar asking about CE forms. I'm going to try to mention it at least two or three times this evening. If you are here, if you stay on for the webinar, you will be sent a CE form. There is nothing you need to do. You don't need to take a quiz or register or anything like that. Um, now, obviously, if you only are on for the first five minutes, you, you're not going to get a CE form. But as long as you're here for the majority of the webinar, uh, those will go out. That can take up to a week or two. Uh, obviously, when we have 1,000 people on a webinar, it takes, uh, takes a little time to get those out. So please be patient, but they, they always send them out. Um, and with that out of the way, I wanted to welcome back Dr. Timothy Kaczynski. Uh, many of you who have been on these webinars are familiar with who he is. He is an affili affiliated adjunct clinical professor at University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry. He's on the editorial review board of Reality, uh, which is the information source for aesthetic dentistry. He's the past editor of the Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. He's uh, currently the editor of the AGD journals, uh, General Dentistry and AGD Impact. He's honored to have been named Implant today, Implants Today, uh, which is the implant publication of Dentistry Today. Uh, he's the editor of that. He's a past president of the Mission Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, he is a DDS. He's a practicing DDS, like most of the people on this call tonight. Uh, he went to University of Detroit uh, and got his mastership in biochemistry from Wayne State University. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology and Implant Dentistry the ICOI, the American Society of Osteointegration. 
He's a fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry and received his mastership in the Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, he has just got just a boatload of honors that he's received. Uh, fellowship in the American and International College of Dentists and the Academy of Dentistry International. About four years ago, he got the Academy of Dentistry International's Humanitarian Award in recognition of significant contributions to the enhancement of the quality of life and the human condition. He's a member of OKU and the Pierre Fouchard Academy. He was a University of Detroit uh, School of Dentistry Alumni Association's Alumnus of the Year, and in 2009 and 2014 and 2020, received the Academy of General Dentistry's Lifelong Learning and Service Recognition. Uh, he's placed, if, you, if, you, if you're not sure if he's done a lot of implants, uh, he's done 15,000 or so, so uh, I'm not sure that there's many people out there who have done more. Uh, he is a prolific author. He has published uh, well over 200 articles on surgical and prosthetic phases of implant dentistry. He was a contributor to textbooks like uh, Principles and Practices of Implant Dentistry. Um, and in 2010, he was also a contributor for dental implantation and technology. Uh, if you have ever seen the Noble BioCare's Noble Vision uh, series, he's featured on that, and he's lectured extensively, and we are lucky to have him here this evening. So, Tim, we're thrilled to have you here and looking forward to the presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. You always make me giggle uh, in, in, in the evening here. So, we have a stormy night here in Detroit, um, a lot of wind and, and a tropical storm weather, I guess, uh, and it's starting to get a little cold, so hopefully it's a little bit uh, nicer in, in California. Well, welcome everybody. Um, yeah, I really enjoy uh, doing these programs and I appreciate um, Kurt with Golden Dent um, asking me to do them uh, because uh, it, it's really a blessing at this stage of my career to be able to, to give back to, to the profession in a small way. And so what I wanted to do um, is, is talk about some of the products and techniques that I use daily in my practice. Lauren, as you, as you mentioned, um, I have a very busy practice here in Detroit and we do a lot of implants, um, which means that we have to remove a lot of teeth and prepare the site, um, ideally, for our dental, uh, future dental implants. And I think for, for the general dentists out there, I'm, I'm a big advocate in general dentists uh, becoming proficient and efficient uh, in, the, in the surgical and prosthetic uh, applications of, of implant dentistry. I think it's number one, very professionally rewarding, uh, mentally stimulating, but uh, obviously very financially rewarding. And most importantly, though, Lauren, is um, your, your, the patients want you to do this work. So learning, learning techniques and, and learning, to, learning um, quality techniques um, that are, are relatively simple and very predictable, um, that, that's a big thing. I know uh, many of our, our listeners tonight have taken grafting courses and, and done grafting in their practices with mixed results. And when you get a mixed results, uh, it's very, very frustrating uh, because there's a lot of time involved and expense to the patient. And oftentimes, you know, dental insurance isn't covering uh, the grafting procedures. So what I, what I wanna leave everybody with tonight at the end of the program in an hour or so is um, a tech, the techniques that I use routinely in my practice uh, to graft, and um, the techniques that I use in suturing so that my grafting materials, uh, my grafting results are very, very predictable. I'm going to know that in three or four months, I have quality uh, regeneration of bone to be able to uh, successfully place a dental implant uh, in an edentulist site. So let's, let's move on. Um, you know, Lauren, thank you for the, the nice introduction. Um, but one of the things I did want to mention is I do have an education website. It's strictly education. It has my my publications and my YouTube videos and and things that may, uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. And it's simply drkaczynski.com. It's uh, simply educational. And, and um, uh, again, a lot of the techniques that I use are demonstrated uh, really clearly there. So I think it's a really nice reference for those um, who are listening tonight. So what are we what are we here for uh, in the next hour? Well, we're going to talk briefly about some minimally invasive uh, extraction techniques. Um, I like to call them a traumatic extraction techniques. You've heard me uh, uh, use that word before, and and sometimes I'm, I'm criticized for it because how can an extraction be a traumatic? Well, and minimally minimally traumatic um, meaning 
minimally traumatic to the available hard tissue, the bones surrounding the edentula space. So let's learn a technique where uh, we're not breaking root tips, we're not fracturing facial plate of bone, where we're able to, to uh, correct a situation uh, quite easily. And then we're gonna talk about the grafting techniques that I use, including some of the reflection uh, designs or flap designs that I use that make um, the end result um, of high quality and very predictable. You're gonna hear me use that word a lot tonight, predictable. We're gonna talk about a couple of different materials. There are hundreds of materials out there. Um, I'm gonna show you what I use in my practice every day. Um, and I do have some, a variety of materials, um, but it's going to be simple and easy to use. And these products can all be purchased through Golden Dent. Um, and I think Kurt at the end of the program is probably gonna have some specials for you, um, including the sutures that I use, the uh, resorbable membranes that I use, and the two type of grafting products that I use. Um, and I'll just dis discuss when I use each individual product. Um, if we don't follow the rules, if we don't follow the cookbook, so to speak, that I'm going to demonstrate today, we oftentimes, end up with results that are non-predictable. The graft does not integrate, uh, it becomes mush, it's not healthy, we get bone loss, bone shrinks up and in or down and in, and we don't have the quality site that we require for future implant placement. And these, these complications can be the result of the reflection design, the materials that we use, the protection of those materials that we use, and the suturing techniques that that we um, that we use to to uh, close the the surgical site. We're going to talk a little bit about um, grafting techniques. I'll show some clinical examples of grafting techniques that I use for immediate implant placement. Now, many of you have heard me before know that I'm not an immediate load kind of guy, other than full arch, uh, all on four, all on six, the all on concept. Um, I'm, I'm for 36 years now, um, I'm a big believer in letting the implant heal um, without a lot of stress on it and, and then go back and restore the situation. We'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Um, and then we're gonna talk a lot about the diagnosing and treatment planning for grafting successes and how we communicate to our patients the importance of grafting. I just mentioned that um, people come in every day in your practice and they're going to be losing a tooth. And if they lose a tooth, physiologically, bone is going to shrink. It's gonna shrink down and in in the mandible, up and in in the maxilla. In the posterior maxilla, um, that tooth root acts like a tent pole holding up a circus tent. And if we remove the tooth root or the tent pole, what happens to the circus tent or the sinus floor? It collapses. And those are the two areas that, that concern the general dentist the most most challenging areas for us to place implants. The posterior mandible, because we're concerned with the, the, um, the uh, canal, the nerve in that, the inferior alveolar can, uh, canal and the nerve. And we're also concerned about the, the sinus area in the posterior maxilla. So grafting procedures is very important in our, in our ability to educate and instruct our patients to understand the, the value of grafting, the investment that they're making which will provide a site for future implant placements. If we don't graft, if we don't allow this, this bone to heal in that certain area, then the, the, our patients may not be candidates for implants without a much more invasive and expensive surgical procedure, such as block grafting in the posterior mandible or, or sinus augmentation in the um, posterior maxilla. So, in a nutshell, we wanna increase our predictability and long-term stability of our bone grafting. And those are the techniques that I'm gonna to demonstrate today. So let's get right into it. Here we have um, a tooth, a, a maxillary molar tooth, three-rooted root canal treated tooth that is symptomatic. Um, uh, endodontist said that it's non-restorable. There's probably a vertical fracture uh, along that post line. Don't we all love posts in dentistry? It's a necessary evil, I know, but we do see a lot of, of fracture, stress fractures of those roots over time, which requires extraction of the teeth. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, uh, I'm not an immediate load person, but I do like immediate implant placement. 
but not in this situation. This, this root, this tooth has three roots. And so it is very rare that I'll place an immediate implant in a maxillary molar area. I would rather that we graft the site, allow it to heal, prevent the, the collapse of the sinus floor in that area, minimize the um, bone shrinkage apically in that area, and provide a source for uh, an implant um, that will be predictable and long lasting with an excellent prognosis. You have to remember in the posterior maxilla, the, the bone quality is the worst in the body. It's very soft, it's very trabecular bone. Why is that? It's to keep our skull light. But that area of the mouth also takes tremendous force. It's like a nutcracker at the holiday time. Where do you put the nut to crack it? In the back of the nutcracker. And so we have poor quality of bone um, in, a, in a site that takes a lot of stress. And here we're replacing a three-rooted tooth which a, with a single designed um, fixture, implant fixture. So there's a lot of risk in this area that we have to, to understand. Also, if we try to place an immediate implant in the area, where would we put it? In the mesial facial socket, in the distal facial socket? Well, obviously we'd like to put it in the palatal socket, but that isn't the correct position because we're going to have uh, some prosthetic complications uh, if we we don't idealize the placement of that implant. So you can see the, the formation of, of a fistulous tract and abscess in that area. This tooth needs to be removed. So I challenge you, how would you remove this tooth in your practice today? Well, it's a rhetorical question. Many of you would uh, take the crown off, section the crown with whatever technique you're going to use, and then section the three roots and take those three roots out individually. It's time consuming. Uh, traumatic, uh, expensive for the burrs to be able to remove that crown. Um, you can see it was a root canal treated tooth and it needs to be extracted. So here I'm taking a periotome. And again, this is a very nice a set of instruments from Golden Dent. Um, and again, you may want to discuss this with Kurt. I'm not sure what kind of um, webinar specials they're going to have, but I know that they put together a nice uh, surgical kit extraction kit. And I'm, what I'm simply doing is I'm not really using it to break the PDL. What I'm doing it is to make sure that I have profound anesthesia uh, in the site. And I'm, I'm not blocking the site, I'm giving infiltration, I'm, I'm uh, blanching the soft tissue. And I'm simply going around to make sure the patients are not experiencing any, any discomfort other than pressure. This is one of my favorite instruments and I can honestly say that I would not practice without it. It's called the Physics Forcep. It was created by Dr. Richard Golden here in Detroit area and is distributed by Golden Dent. It's a series of four instruments, an upper right, an upper anterior, an upper left, and a, a universal lower forcep. You can see that it consists of two components. It's, we have a shovel-shaped beak area, which is really the working end of the instrument. And this shovel-shaped beak area will engage the palatal or lingual aspect of the tooth to be extracted one to three millimeters subgingival. The second part of the instrument is, re is referred to as a bumper. And here you can see we have these little silicone um, protective coatings, like spongy coatings. And this part is placed as high up or as down low into the vestibule as possible. However, it is not the working end of the instrument. It's not holding the facial plate of bone. It is simply acting as a fulcrum uh, point or a center of rotation. We call it a forcep. I wish we didn't call it a forcep because it's really, it's really an elevator. Um, and what we're going to be doing without squeezing these handles, we're going to create tension on the palatal or lingual aspect of our root. And without any squeezing of the instrument, without any forearm, bicep, shoulder pressure whatsoever, I'm simply going to gently hold the handles and rotate my wrist. In this particular maxillary tooth, we're gonna rotate my wrist towards the corner of the eye. This is going to create tension on the palatal aspect of this tooth. That tension is going to result in a physiologic response. The body is going to release an enzyme, which is going to break down the periodontal ligament. Doctors, what is holding that tooth in place? It's not bone, it's the periodontal ligament. 
If the periodontal ligament is melted away, theoretically, this tooth is going to follow that arc of rotation and lift up and out of that socket atraumatically or minimally traumatically. I can't tell you how many hundreds of patients who we've done an extraction will look at me after we're done and say, you're kidding, you're done? Uh, because they're used, they're used to conventional forcep techniques where we're squeezing the handles of our forcep and we're using tremendous bicep and forearm pressure to, to try to, to remove that tooth. Totally different concept with the physic forcep. And here you can see the bumper guard, the bumper, which is not the working end of the instrument, it's a center of rotation, and the serrated beak, which is the working end of the instrument. It is going to be used to create tension on the palatal or lingual aspect of the root. Simply rotating my wrist will create that tension and will lift that tooth up and out of the socket in a matter of about a minute. So here we're demonstrating the beak placement one to three millimeters subgingival. The bumper is placed as high up the vestibule as possible. And with simple rotating of my wrist without squeezing the handles, that tooth, as the PDL, uh, periodontal ligament is, is obliterated, will lift up and out of the socket without causing trauma to the patient, emotional trauma, physical trauma. They may feel a little pressure, but really no discomfort and not the, the the angst that they get when we uh, put tremendous pressure um, on those teeth. So atraumatic to the facial plate of bone, atraumatic to the patient, and as importantly, atraumatic to me because I'm saving my body. I'm saving my hands, my back, my forearms. Um, if you don't have a lot of manual dexterity or, or strength in your hands, this is an excellent, excellent tool. And again, I would not practice without it. The instrument is not intended to remove the tooth in total. Rather, it's intended to luxate the tooth up and out of the socket. It will actually pop, and you can see I'm very gently holding it. It's really I'm putting pressure on that pallet aspect with my index finger. Again, the, tooth, the, the instrument is not intended to remove the tooth in total, so we have what's called a tooth delivery instrument. Um, once the tooth luxates up and out of the socket, about one to three millimeters, I will take this bird beak forcep and simply remove the tooth in total, atraumatically. You can see the divergence of this root is pretty, pretty amazing. And we were able to do this without removing the crown, without sectioning those individual roots, without a lot of trauma, and literally in a matter of minutes. And you can see the issues that were demonstrated with this, with this tooth. So now we have a socket site, three separate sockets. And it's very, very important at this juncture that we eliminate the granulation tissue from that site. This is a very, very important part of the technique is we take a sharp curette. And I would suggest that if, if Kurt with Golden Dent is, is willing to, to put together a special, to put a surgical kit together, uh, I, think, I think we've done that before. Have, have your instruments on hand that are sharp. Um, and we're simply scraping the, the hard tissue, eliminating or removing as much granulation as we possibly can. Um, a question that is gonna be asked, and, and we'll probably answer it with Lauren at the end, is you're concerned about the sinus and how much pressure do we put up there? I want you to try to remove as much of that snot, that granulation tissue as possible from, that, from those socket sites. But I, I like to use the analogy of, of a hangnail. For those, if you've ever had a hangnail uh, on your big toe, it's miserable. You can't walk, it's uncomfortable. You're at Disney, you're walking around, you're, it's just unbelievable pain. You go back, you soak your foot, you clip that, that, that um, uh, impinging nail, and within five minutes, you forget about it. The same thing happens with the body. The body's an amazing thing. If you eliminate the source of the infection, it will heal very well. So even though I want to remove as much granulation as possible, I am very comfortable in grafting, and I'm going to demonstrate the technique now, grafting that site um, and allowing it to heal, allow the, the bone to regenerate, and then putting an implant in the future. I do not, I do not, I do not place an implant in an infected area where there was periodontitis. I will never do that. 
So this is the osteogen plug. It is a um, non-ceramic bone grafting. Uh, it's calcium apatite in a, a type one bovine Achilles tendon matrix. This is not a collagen plug. It is not a collagen plug. This is something that uh, will resorb in time. It's, it's made of the same bone building uh, materials that natural bone, calcium and phosphorus. Um, I've done um, thousands of these. I've done a lot of histology, which we'll demonstrate in a moment. And it is probably the most simplest or the simplest technique to use for grafting. Now let's back up. Our patients are cost conscious. Doctors, my patients don't want to pay for a grafting. Traditional allograft and a membrane can be expensive for us to purchase in excess of $200 in material costs. This is a product that is in the $40 to $50 range. It does not require a membrane. The um, bovine Achilles tendon matrix prevents invagination of epithelium. Invagination of epithelium is why we place a membrane to protect our more conventional grafting uh, materials. Um, it is ideal in a situation where we have the facial wall intact. It's ideal when we have the facial wall intact. If we're missing the facial wall, for whatever reason, trauma or uh, infection, we can still use this material. But if that defect is greater than four millimeters, I strongly recommend that we go back to our traditional technique of placing a membrane two millimeters beyond the defect. I'm gonna demonstrate that in a few moments. But in this situation, we have an osteogen plug and there's three different sizes, a slim, a wide, and an extra wide. And they all cost the same. And you can talk to, uh, to Kurt at Golden Dent. Um, I would strongly recommend that you have this um, on hand. Remember that the, the procedure is to prepare the site for a future implant, to, to minimize the bone loss that will occur physiologically up and in and collapse of the sinus floor. You can see I've taken this, this membrane, I've taken a pair of scissors or a scalpel blade, and I've cut it into basically the shape of that of those divergent roots in our tooth. It's a combination of bioactive crystal particulate, calcium appetite. It makes socket preservation easy and affordable for you, the practitioner, and for our patients. No membrane is required and the, the, the material will stay in place and will allow for integration of natural bone. The body will, will osteoclasts will invade, eat it away, and osteoblasts will lay down new bone. Now it's imperative to remember that bone heals from the apex towards the crest. So we can actually visualize objectively, radiographically, the turnover to natural bone but we are gonna see more um, natural looking uh, radio opaque uh, material at the apex. And over time, it will generate more towards the crest. So the technique is simple. We extract the tooth, we clean, we place the plug with firm pressure. It's not amalgam, we're not crushing it, but with firm pressure slightly above the crest of the, of the uh, socket site. We will then suture the area. I'm gonna demonstrate that in a few minutes. And the, the crystals will resorb over a period of time. And within three to five months, we have natural bone in preparation for our dental implant. Benefits, the graft and the collagen matrix are combined. We, can, we do not use, need a membrane for socket preservation. The graft material is in, in place, it's inert, it's biocompatible. It restricts the uh, migration of connective or epithelial tissue, uh, both because of a physical and chemical barrier. The barrier is created as you compress the plug down into the socket. This compression gives the epithelial cells a choice. Do they wanna fight down through the condensed plug or simply go over the top? and they're always gonna to wanna to follow the, the, the path of least resistance. That's a physiologic reaction. This is a material that, that, that I love and use every day. 
So we have our socket. You can see I did not reflect the area. We do have a facial plate of bone. I took our osteogen plug um, and cut it to make it look like the, the uh, um, tripod of the extracted tooth. And I'm placing it firmly into the socket site. Again, you want clean tools. Please do not use your amalgam plugger. Get a surgical kit and you're going to become very, very proficient. Suturing is very important. Um, suturing is critical to the success. I like to use Vicryl, which is a polyglycolic acid material. It is a resorbable membrane. I know we all have our, our favorite sutures. Um, what I like about this, this material is that it resorbs. In, a, in 14 to 21 days, I like to see my surgical patients in a week to 10 days anyways, um, but it resorbs to water. So we don't get a lot of inflammation with this particular suture. And again, this can be purchased through Golden Dent. But I want to demonstrate my technique. And this is important. Most of us, I'm going to assume, if you're going to suture this site, would take our reverse cutting needle, engage the facial aspect of the tissue, and go towards the palate. So you'd go facial the palate. The problem with that technique is that if you had a membrane, oftentimes we will engage that membrane as you're going from facial to palatal. And when we remove that suture, we lift the membrane out of uh, the socket. When we use a membrane, that membrane must be in place, undisturbed, for a minimum of six weeks. If the membrane comes out before six weeks, the case becomes unpredictable. Now doctors, I didn't say that the graft won't work or we won't get integration. I'm just saying there's a chance that it won't. It may be unpredictable. And I know all of you listening have had that situation. You've grafted and come back and it was mushy. It's happened to me early on. So here I'm taking my reverse cutting needle and here I'm going from the, the crest or the socket site towards the facial. That way the curvature of this suture uh, of the needle is riding up on top of the membrane or the graft material in this situation. So I'm not penetrating through the membrane or the graft. I'm then simply going to take this reverse cutting needle. And as I said, there's a lot of different sutures out there. I love the polyglycolic acid. That's my go-to. It's braided. Uh, it resorbs in about 28 days. But as I said, I like to remove my sutures in about a week. Um, I have two different diameters, uh, um, uh, radiuses of needles. I use a 3 8 circle and a 1 half circle, depending on the, the um, uh, area that I want to, to suture. It's a reverse cutting needle. So we don't get uh, tension on, upon closure. And again, these sutures are available through Golden Dent at a very, very reasonable, reasonable cost. Um, this is the book that, that I really like. Um, and, I, and I just want to, if you want to take a quick snapshot of it from Lee Silverstein. Um, and it's available through Salvin Dental. Don't, don't go to Amazon. They want like, I don't know, $500 for the book. You can get it through. Um, uh, Salvin Dental for, for $100. And it's a schematic uh, di diagram kind of book that will help you in demonstrating um, the suture techniques that I'm going to demonstrate today. Uh, I know we've done suture, suture webinars before that were pretty popular where we can practice on oranges or grapefruits. Um, so I, I strongly recommend if, if you're having issues uh, suturing, this is a great, a great book, uh, great reference book. So we, we took our reverse cutting needle and I went from the crest towards the facial. Now I'm reversing it and I'm going from the crest towards the palatal. And you can see the, the pal the needle popping through the palatal, palatal aspect. And I'm simply making an interrupted suture. I do not care about primary closure with this material. I care more that we have a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of my implant site, my future implant site. We must have attached gingiva on the facial aspect of, of all our implants. 
And that's a whole nother, another webinar that maybe maybe we can be invited to, or maybe Lauren can even be involved with. Uh, but that's very, very imperative with implant dentistry. So then I simply made another interrupted suture, um, cross-linking from crest to facial, and again, going from crest to palatal. And now I have uh, sutures that are kind of holding that graft material in place. Remember, this is not a collagen, it has substance to it. And then I'm just gonna put a couple extra sutures there to hold that material in place. You can see the blanched uh, tissue on the facial aspect, that's my band of attached gingiva. Now, we have to understand that epithelium will grow a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. What do we have there, a, a sonometer? So it could take a week to two weeks for this um, epithelium to grow over the top of this uh, grafted site. Again, I like to see the patient a week to 10 days to evaluate. Um, no straws, no heavy spitting, no poking. Stay away from crunchy foods like nacho chips, potato chips, anything that can poke that area. We want these sutures to remain in, intact. Um, patients really don't experience a lot of discomfort. Here we take a post-op, immediate post-op radiograph, and you can see the, the material does have some radiolucency to it, doesn't it? A little radiopacity, a little radiolucency to the site. Four months post-op, what we see is we do see some, some bone shrinkage, um, but we most importantly in this photograph, we see that we have opacity on the apical aspect of the graft, but we still see radiolucency on the, the coronal portion of this graft. And then we see soft tissue on top of that. So physiologically, the site is going to heal from the apex towards the crest. If I'm going to place a dental implant, my initial stability with my dental implant occurs in the apical two millimeters of the implant. Where is the bone strongest right now? Where do we get best integration of the graft? The apical portion, maybe the apical half in this situation, apical 60%. So I have no issues putting an implant in this site and allowing that implant to heal for another four months. And what's going to happen is that coronal portion of the graft is going to continue to integrate and turn over to natural bone. So we now have a surgical site, we have attached gingiva, we have epithelium, we anesthetize the area, and here I'm going to go ahead and make an incision, um, a crestal incision, and I want to show you what we have. We have bone formation in that site. We have bone formation in that site. What I will often do is um, do a histologic evaluation um, I'm taking a, um, a, a trephine that will take us a, a core sample of where I want to place the implant. Um, and I'm taking a core sample and then we'll do histologic evaluations. And what we're showing you here is the magenta color, the pink color is bone formation. The purplish color, violet cover, is the implanted material that is not uh, turned over at this, at this juncture. So we can see that we are getting bone conversion, natural bone conversion in this site, not complete. It takes about a year for bone to mature completely, but better bone formation at the apical, what did I say, 60%, where we can place our implant with initial stability and allow it to integrate for, for time. And then that bone is gonna to continue to generate, regenerate. Then we're using our surgical technique. The, the type of implant is irrelevant here. With most techniques, we have a, a pilot burr. Uh, here's a 2.4 diameter pilot burr. I'm uh, angling the implant mesial distal, buccal lingual to the correct position, which I could not do, which I could not do uh, if I had immediately placed the implant. Because that bone quality in that posterior area, as I said in the very beginning, is um, soft, it's trabecular. I'm gonna use what we call an osteotome to not cut away bone, but to compress it, and also to lift that sinus floor 
uh, to give me as much support as I can. I'm going to widen the osteotomy, compressing that, that uh, immature bone, widening the osteotomy, widening the osteotomy, widening the osteotomy to the correct position. Now here I've taken a resorbable membrane from Golden Dent and I've cut a little circle and I'm going to put it in my uh, osteotomy site. And this is going to be my new floor, so to speak. I didn't penetrate through the, the, the sinus, the Schneiderian membrane, but it's just kind of a, a parachute to kind of hold my graft material. I'm tucking it up into that area. And I'm gonna take another osteogen plug, again, a slim plug in this situation, and I'm placing it into the graft, uh, into the osteotomy site. I'm going to pack it again. And this is where I'm going to initially uh, thread my implant, torque my implant into position. So I'm kind of sealing it, double sealing it, so to speak, um, to provide as much stability. And I was able to torque this implant in a extracted, grafted site to 40 Newton centimeters. That's an incredible amount of torque in an area where the bone is relatively soft. The implant is placed to the crest of the ridge. And again, my suturing techniques are very, very um, simple and routine. Crest to facial, crest to palatal, and I'm simply closing the site. Again, I care about attached gingiva, and you can see that I clearly have a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect. I'm not overly concerned with uh, primary closure. Um, because epithelium, again, will grow a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. It'll close nicely for us. So the site is closed, sutured in the position, and um, you can see the mature bone at the apical portion. You can see we lifted the sinus floor a little bit. Immature bone at the uh, coronal portion, where it's a little bit radiolucent, but you saw visually that that implant was placed to the crest of the ridge. And again, a post-operative CBCT for education shows the position of that implant right at the crest of the ridge with, with excellent turnover of our grafted material, our very inexpensive, very easy to use grafted material, a little bit immature at the coronal portion, but that will continue to integrate um, over time. So let's look at a mandibular molar, same type of situation. Um, root canal treated tooth, non-restorable, uh, abscess, fistula. We're going to remove this tooth, uh, probably of a uh, vertical fracture. And again, um, here's um, the, the surgical kit that we created for Golden Dent. Very, very high quality, relatively inexpensive. Uh, very, very impressed what they're able to do. You need a surgical kit if you're going to become proficient and efficient in your surgical uh, techniques everything you need um, to be able to, to provide a great service for your patients. So again, uh, we, we anesthetize the area. I'm taking my periotome just to make sure I have profound anesthesia. And this is a golden dent um, cow horn. It's a little bit different than your traditional cow horn in that the beaks are very, very long. And here we're engaging the, the uh, furcation area. And the technique here is it's the same as with the physics forcep. We're creating tension on the tooth, which is going to result in a physiologic release of an enzyme to break down the periodontal ligament. So here I am squeezing the handles and I'm going to rotate. I'm rotating towards the facial and I'm holding it to 10 seconds. I actually count to 10 seconds, putting pressure. Rotate it towards the facial, holding it for 10 seconds. And I may go back and forth a few times, and that tooth will come up and out of the socket in a matter of a minute, doctors. Always take a radiograph. Please don't leave root tips in the mouth. Um, that's very frustrating for, for me as an implant person. You can see the site. What are we going to do next, doctors? 
we're going to curette. We're going to curette, 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 eliminate the granulation. The golden dense serrated curette is perfect. And look at the snot that we're removing from that, that area, the granulation that we're removing from that socket. That must be eliminated. Here I'm using an Orban knife um, to, to make my uh, reflection. I want to see the defect in that area. And you can see we have a facial defect. It's not a facial defect that I created. Okay, it's a facial de defect created by the infection or the fracture. And here is that um, uh, osteogen plug, the large size plug. And again, I'm placing it. You can see how the blood likes to absorb into it. I'm packing it firmly, not crushing it, but firmly to the apex and leaving it slightly above the crust of the ridge, packing it firmly. Again, this is a really nice material. You can see my band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect. You can see that my reflection was very conservative. Doctors, you won't see me make vertical incisions very often. Um, it, as long as we're not incising into mucosal tissue, the patients do not experience a lot of postoperative discomfort. Once we cut into mucosa or incise into mucosa, we'll get prostaglandin and histamine release, and that's where your patients are going to experience a lot of discomfort. And that's the bad rap we get as dentists for hurting our patients when we're doing extractions. This is not a painful procedure for our patients. My patients will take Advil uh, postoperatively for discomfort. It's rare that you give anything stronger. I don't care about primary closure because of the uniqueness of this material. I, I care that we have uh, a band of attached gingiva, and I care that we uh, have sutures that will allow us to maintain that graft into site. No smoking, no spitting, no sharp objects, no sharp foods. And again, my uh, suturing techniques is very consistent. Crest to facial, crest to palatal. And again, I'm not overly concerned with uh, primary closure. You can see one week post-op. It has not healed over completely, but it will continue at a half a millimeter a day. You can see three months post-op. We have more radial opacity at the apical portion that we, than we do at the crustal portion, but certainly we have a site that is viable for us to place an implant. Uh, Preoperative CBCT analysis helps me in the design placement uh, of, the, of the implant and the uh, positioning of the vital anatomy, the mandibular nerve, and you can see my um, three months postoperative uh, healing of the epithelium. I'm taking my Orban knife, which is simply a sharp um, curved blade. I'm reflecting the site. And what am I showing you, doctors? I'm showing you a site that had a tremendous defect. Remember that big granulation that was there? We eliminated that, and we now have a site in preparation for an implant. And again, uh, to doing a histologic sample for you, the magenta is bone. Is this completely mature? No, but it's mature enough that I can predictably place my dental implant uh, in this site. Same surgical technique, small burr, wider burr. We're harvesting the bone. We're going to widen the osteotomy, widening the osteotomy, widening the osteotomy. And here we're going to place our dental implant into that socket site torquing it to site to 45 newton centimeters in a grafted site. This is a remarkable amount of, of, of torque in initial stability. A cover screw is placed. And uh, I'm sorry, this is a healing abutment. Because we're able to torque that implant to um, at least 25 newton centimeters, I'm taking a what we call a healing abutment, which is a taller screw that will penetrate through the soft tissue it's torqued to 25 newton centimeters, and I'm simply going to reposition that band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of this tall healing abutment. We'll allow this site to heal. My implant placement with my healing abutment, and we are able to very, very predictably um, 
place an implant in a grafted site, a very, very infected grafted site. So when you have to talk to your patients, our job isn't to sell, our job is to educate and instruct. Why is it important when we remove a tooth? They know they have to remove the tooth. Why grafting is important? Why do they have to pay for this grafting procedure that insurance may not cover? Well, it'll help minimize or prevent bone loss apically and facially. It'll support the soft tissue architecture, can prevent periodontal pathology, and it could provide an adequate site for implants in three to four in, in 12 to 16 weeks or three to four months. I demonstrated that, and it's very routine. If you don't graft, epithelium will, will, will uh, invaginate into the socket site. We will get loss of ridge height and width. And the literature will say we get 30 to 60% bone loss in a three-year period, which means that the may, patient may require a much more invasive, expensive surgical procedure if they want an implant in the future. Sinus augmentation, block grafting in the posterior mandible. Grafts fail, and we've all had that situation. I had early in my career, poor case selection, health of the patient, wound opening, your suturing techniques. Again, if you're using a membrane, that membrane must be intact for at least six weeks for us to have predictability. With the osteogen plug, we don't need a membrane. So, but we want uh, primary closure over time. Infected environment, it's important that you, you curette, curette, eliminate the, as much of the granulation as possible. And again, my flap or my reflection design is very precise. I rarely incise into mucosa, uh, which eliminates postoperative discomfort, which makes you a hero in the eyes of your patients. A positive experience, will will have your patients um, will have your patients um, uh, compliment you to their friends and family, and that's how you build your practice. All skeletal bone demonstrates volume stability over time, except the bone that we need, dental alveolar bone. Why? Because the dental alveolus is very labile in the absence of loading. Bone grafting is possible because bone tissue, unlike most other tissues, has the ability to regenerate completely if provided the space into which to grow. As native bone grows, it will generally replace the graft material completely, resulting in a fully integrated region of new bone. The biologic mechanisms that provide a rationale for bone grafting are osteoconduction, induction, and osteogenesis. Osteogenesis is when we use the patient's natural bone, Osteoinduction um, is when we have um, uh, properties within our grafting material, um, uh, plasma-rich uh, fibrin, um, or if we're mixing it with patient's own bone. With the osteogen plug, we're talking about osteoconduction, which is like a, a matrix that allows bone formation to occur. There's different types of materials. There's a myriad. And I wanted to demonstrate um, the osteogen, the calcium uh, phosphate, calcium apatite material, um, which is like human bone. It's non-sintered. It's very unique. It's not a collagen plug. And I strongly recommend that you uh, evaluate it. Lauren, I'm going to stop here so that we have time for questions, uh, if that's OK with you. Of course it's OK with me. <laughs> Uh, before we do that, though, as I mentioned at the uh, beginning of the, the presentation, uh, we don't have a ton of questions right so far. I mean, I don't know if people's uh, keyboards are broken or their fingers are broken, but uh, this is a great time. To... That's, the problem, <laughs> that, that's the problem, Tim, is that you, you answered every question they could possibly have. And I'll give them a few minutes to think about it. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, these webinars do not create themselves. Uh, we depend on sponsorship and participation. And uh, Golden Dent has been fantastic with that. One of the reasons I love working with them is that uh, not only are they going to offer specials when it comes to their products that were mentioned this evening, they're also going to have some great educational opportunities. So I'm going to turn it over to Kurt Lawler from Golden Dent. Uh, he will talk a little bit about that for a few minutes, and then we will switch over to the Q&A session. 
Great. Thanks, Lauren. I appreciate it. Hello, everybody. My name is Kurt Lawler. I'm uh, also here in Detroit uh, with Golden Dent. So if you're not familiar with Golden Dent, uh, we started in uh, the, the product and educational aspect of, um, I guess, our third generational dental family here in Detroit in 2007. And we're a Detroit-based uh, company that operates under the principle of providing uh, simple, predictable, and unconventional uh, dental products. We we provide unique products, and we also have a lot of focus on uh, CE or educational programs like webinars and and uh, live patient type programs, which I'll talk about here in a moment. So thanks again for joining us this evening. I'll go through this uh, quite quickly uh, so we can get to the uh, the questions here. So for uh, joining our webinar this evening, we do provide a, a discount code usually on the webinars. We appreciate your time and uh, to be rewarded for uh, joining us this evening for the webinar, we have a 13% discount this evening uh, with the code of, uh, it's DISTAL13. So it's just D-I-S-T-A-L and then the numeric 1-3. And uh, our products that were uh, discussed this evening, as well as many other ones, those are at uh, Golden Dash Dent. There, there is a there's a hyphen or a dash there between Golden and Dent. And our educational programs, um, which I'll just mention here quickly uh, in a moment, that's at AmplifiedDental.com. That's where we keep our uh, educational components uh, separated from the product-based uh, business of Golden Dent. We do the specials for uh, 24 hours. Uh, we do uh, kind of quick deals here. They're better than the trade show pricing that we offer, so we just do them kind of quickly. Um, if there's anything that caught your eye this evening or if you have any questions on a product or if you want to give them a try, uh, give us a call or obviously you can you can take a look at them on the website. There's lots of videos and things too to support uh, further the products and how they work. Uh, the physics force up. This is kind of what, what started the, the Golden Den aspect of the business, like I said, um, in 2007. Uh, we, we went over this technique uh, in good detail already through the presentation, so I won't spend much time on it, but this is our, our most popular set. This was the first um, set that we made. We do have one other set of instruments that goes back further into the mouth for just like posterior teeth, um, but these are the ones I'd recommend for sure if anybody um, has not used the product. They're the easiest to use and easiest to understand the, the, the technique and, and make sure they're a right fit for you. And uh, you have 30 days to, to try them out in your, your hands to see if they work for you in your office. So this is called our standard series set. There's three uppers and one lower instrument. Uh, prior to the physics forceps, we it was demonstrated in the presentation, but you can really use just about anything. If you like a luxator, or we have like these bayonet type elevators, or we have an instrument we call the wedge, uh, all these are gonna work uh, perfectly. Uh, the physics forcep is really not a forcep, as we mentioned. It's a, it's really a lingual elevator itself. So it's not something that's necessary, but obviously if you do want to separate the tissue or use some sort of elevator in advance, it's, it's really not going to hurt. Uh, these are our conventional forceps. Uh, we took a, a 150, 151, upper right, and these types of instruments, and uh, we really just gave them a nice, fin nice finish. Uh, they're lightweight and they have a nice, um, nice grip. So if the physics forceps is not uh, something that you think will work for you. I just wanted to mention, we also do have a nice set of conventional instruments available too called uh, uh, the Golden Force instruments. This is the graft kit. So this is really gonna have the basic instruments and what you're gonna need to do grafting. Um, it's not expensive. It comes in this cassette and it's, it's under $500 for all these instruments. And then with the uh, the discount code, it'll it'll be a little bit cheaper than that. Um, the Serita Curette that we mentioned, this is really, really perfect for um, getting the, the granulation tissue out of the, the socket site following the extraction. And, uh, and sometimes we get complaints that the oxygen plug might uh, cause some discomfort with the patient and it's probably gonna be because there wasn't adequate bleeding. So this is a great solution for that. You're obviously gonna wanna uh, create uh, bleeding within the socket site before using the oxygen plug um, just to prevent that issue. Uh, we do have these in stock. So I, if anybody did order them before, I know we, um, it was popular for us and we did we did run out of them, but we do have them again now. So I apologize if anybody did have to wait uh, that did order it the first time. This is another great option. So if you can't manually um, get the degranulation tissue out of the socket, th these are really nice burrs, the ones that are shown on the top right there, these tissue and degranulation burrs. This is part of our uh, 
our bone grafting burr kit that has some nice bone shaping or bone leveling burrs in these uh, degranulation burrs. And then a shaping burr and a cutting burr. So it has really everything you need for grafting um, in a nice little kit here. So th these are obviously not one-time uh, use burrs. You can just autoclave them in the burr block. Um, Allograft, I, I don't even know, I don't know if we showed an allograft case this year, but so the allograft obviously is going to be your conventional type graft uh, if you're not going to use an osteogen plug or if you have maybe a, 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 a facial defect or if it's not a right case for a plug. Um, the gold os allograft is our line of uh, particulate and, and putty, uh, or it's a particular form and putty form of an allograft. And so if you're using another brand, uh, we, you know, our, our pricing is very fair and then with the discount, um, it's a good opportunity to try our gold os brand if you're not currently using our graft and then uh, the plug we went over in great detail we obviously have the osteogen plugs and then for membranes uh, these are three good membranes uh, we recently added this osteoflex membrane for anybody that's uh, joined our webinars on a regular basis uh, this might be new to you um, it, it's a pericardium uh, membrane that we uh, have just added sort of recently. We have been testing it out and have had good feedback so far. So that's that's one to take a look at. And then our our, our most popular one um, over the number of years has been the EpiGuide membrane. These are both long lasting uh, resorbable membranes, so they will stay in place uh, for the uh, the six to eight weeks that Dr. Kaczynski mentioned is necessary for a graft. Sutures, uh, our PGA sutures we have, those were already shown. And then we do have other sutures, like if you're, like uh, Dr. Kaczynski mentioned, everybody has a, a preference. We have black silk and some other ones available too. I uh, just wanted to mention that. So our CE courses, we just did our first live patient course in about a year and a half just due to COVID uh, last weekend, and uh, it was a great success. So uh, we have courses coming up, uh, I think October, November, and December. Uh, so you can take a look at Amplified Dental if you're interested in those. And then we do have, oh, here's some pictures from the, the course actually just this past weekend. Just say so we have like a, a classroom based component day one and then day two, we actually do uh, live patient treatment. So again, here's just some of the attendees doing the extractions and crafting procedures. It's really cool because you get to you get to try all the products that, um, you know, we're demonstrating this evening. You can try different allografts, different membranes, the estrogen plug and kind of see what's the right fit for you and what, what product you like. Um, I'll mention two more courses. These are coming up. We have a ton of courses in October. So October 22nd, 23rd, we have a, a, a guided full arch implant course you can learn more about on amplifydental.com. And then we do have a endo for the GP program too coming up. Uh, looks like she's already next, uh, next Friday, it looks like. Uh, so lots of offers on Amplify Dental for Education. We keep adding more and more programs. And uh, I'll leave it at that and leave up the 13% discount code and turn it back to uh, Lauren to go over the questions. Thanks everybody, I appreciate Great. it. Thank you, Kurt, we, we appreciate it. Uh, Tim, you ready? Absolutely. So I spoke too soon, I, I think maybe, I don't know if go to webinar I was having some type of hiccup, because as soon as I said, you know, we only have two questions, all of a sudden it just started <laughs> flooding in, now we got about 40, so <laughs> I'm gonna do my best to get through these and, uh, and try to combine a few as well, because we do want to get to as many as we can. Um, just as a reminder, uh, for those of you who may not have been here at the beginning uh, of the webinar, the webinar was recorded. Uh, it, that recording usually goes out in a day or two. Uh, if you were on for the majority of the webinar, you will be sent a CE certificate. Uh, that usually takes about a week or two, um, and there's nothing that you need to do. There's no quiz or registration or anything like that. Once you log out, you're done and you'll be sent that. Uh, they go through the list and obviously they're not going to send it to someone who's only been on for five minutes. But if you were here for the bulk of the hour, you'll, you'll be sent to CE. So let's get to the questions. Um, I know we get this a, a lot, Tim. So can you kind of describe, I mean, when, when you're doing the physics forceps, are you applying constant pressure? Is it more like of an intermittent pressure? And, and how long does it typically take uh, for that tooth to come out? You know, assuming it's not ankle loss or anything like that. You know, it's a great, it's a great question. And, and it's a question that we do get all the time. And, and um, you know, Kurt, um, with Golden Dent, it, it, the, the courses that, that are provided at, at our University of Detroit uh, Dental School are, are pretty amazing, um, where you're able to remove a myriad of, of very challenging teeth using the physics forcep. So I'm, I'm just gonna back up a little bit before I answer that question. That's a great way to learn. I, I'm a big believer in education. I'm a big believer in hands-on. Um, you know, you can watch me, um, you know, doing a video or, or a slide, 
and it doesn't really mean anything. But if you can do it with, with um, uh, you know, on a live patient, it's great. So I, I do challenge you, if you're really inclined to get proficient with atraumatic or minimally traumatic extractions, is, is to contact Golden Dent and um, you know come to Detroit. It, the city's beautiful. Uh, there's lots to do. Uh, easy easy in and out access to the to the airport. Uh, airports are, are really nice. Um, so th that's a great way to learn. But to answer your question, we're creating tension on the palatal lingual aspect of the tooth. We're not squeezing the handles. I'm simply rotating my wrist. Constant pressure. It's going to create tension which is releasing hyaluronidase from the body, which is breaking down the, the periodontal ligament. And it, it literally takes 30 seconds to two minutes, depending on the tooth, um, but it's, it's constant pressure. But the important thing is, is that we're not squeezing. Um, we're, you know, that's where roots get broken and uh, facial plate is, is, is fractured with our conventional extraction techniques. So it's technique sensitive, truly not, not a forceps, it's more of a, of a luxator uh, than anything else, but it's a wonderful, wonderful tool um, that saves me a lot of time and, and time is money in my practice. Okay. Do you pre-medicate the patient when you extract and graft? I assume they mean uh, antibiotic versus pain yeah, but, um, uh, or maybe pain, I mean. <laughs> great, that's another great question. I'm not a big uh, antibiotic user, um, uh, you know, but I'm old school. Um, routinely, um, if, if I'm going to be invasive, I will give amoxicillin um, three times a day for three days. If I can start the night before, that's great. But most, many patients come in, uh, you know, uh, and, and want the procedure done right away. So I'll start them uh, immediately after the extraction. But amoxicillin three times a day for three days is, is pretty much my protocol. Okay. What about like a local antibiotic into the socket or is there ever an indication no. for doing something like that? I, I you know, I, I've heard that back and forth for, for 30 years. Uh, I've never done that. I've never mixed, mixed my graph with tetracycline or anything like that. I, I never found it um, necessary. Okay. Uh, speaking about mixing graft, uh, one of our speakers said that they work with a periodontist who mixes allograft and xenograft. He said he lowers the patient's risk of foreign body reaction with the xenograft and also decreases the quicker resorption of the allograft by mixing the two. Any thoughts on that? Um, I'm not a xenograft user. Um, uh, because I do so many implants, Lauren, um, you know, the xenograft is, is, a, great, is a great material for, for holding a, um, a contouring a ridge or holding a ridge, um, but it doesn't resorb, the, the particulate really doesn't resorb the way I would want it to. It, it stays more like pieces of concrete or stone. Um, so I'm not, personally, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I, I'm, I'm not a big um, xenograft user. Um, I think biocompatibility is, is critical with our synthetic materials, uh, with a product like um, um, Osteogen that's been around for, for 30, 40 years. Um, you know, around the world, um, a lot of clinical experience. Again, I do a lot of histology with it, um, and it's very, very cost effective. One of the reasons why we're not grafting is is because of the cost of the patients, uh, and the, or the patients are balking. And when you can when you can provide a great service for forty or fifty dollars in material cost, that's quite a service you can provide your patients. Right. Okay. Um, do you uh, will you routinely graft even if the patient isn't planning to do an implant down the road? Well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I do. Um, and and the reason is, I think it's important that we communicate with our patients. If we do not, we don't know where that 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 socket's going to heal. It's going to shrink. It's going to shrink down and in or up and in. How many times have you seen um, the, um, the the audience out here? How many times have you you've seen um, you know big concavity on the facial aspect, uh, and that's because it wasn't grafted, and, and the body will heal the way it's going to heal. Um, we never know exactly how it's going to heal, but grafting is is in a, a very very important part of my practice. Okay, um, one of the the cases that you showed was I think the lower molar, and uh, the, one of the the people is asking why you didn't place a membrane in that facial defect of that lower molar. So again, um, with, with the osteogen plug, uh, because of the bovine Achilles tendon, if, if my defect is four millimeters or less on the facial aspect, I don't have to put a membrane. But if, it, if it's a really long facial defect, that's where I will, I can use the osteogen plug, but I will try to um, 
I'll put a resorbable membrane on there uh, just to give me a little little added security. Uh, but in that situation, because it was it was probably about four millimeters, I didn't feel it was necessary. Great question. Okay. Yep. Um, someone was asking, uh, do you ever, ever have an issue where you find that that granulation tissue is just you just can't numb it up? Uh, she was saying that she combined four percent septo, one to hundred thousand, two percent lido, one to hundred thousand in mepiplane. Uh, granulation tissue was very sensitive, and of course, infected tissue that's most resistant to, to you know due to pH changes. So, do you see that, and what? How do you deal with it? Yeah, you know, I, I you know I think that that if they're feeling it, you know, in the socket, I would just you know I would use my needle, and and you have to put pressure, you, you know, a kind of like a intraosseous um, to get the material there. It's it's not the granulation that that is necessarily um, causing the discomfort, but I I would inject right into that socket with force okay uh on the pain uh <laughs> train here uh someone was saying that they used a um a an osteogen plug on a mandibular molar and cleaned it out and the patient had acute post-operative pain um i have much less of an issue using minced prf and particulate with a call with a collagen membrane does this happen to you and can you explain what may have gone wrong you know i i've, I've heard that periodically and I'm going to be very honest with you, I, I have not. Um, a, a couple aspects, and Kurt mentioned, um, you know, you, de you do need a bleeding point. It has to be bleeding. So a sharp curette or taking a, a round burr to get, get a bleeding point is very, very important. You don't want to overpack the material. It's not amalgam. You're not crushing it. You're firmly placing it and, again, suturing on the top of it. So I, I, I can't... I, I've heard that, but I can honestly say that I, I don't see that in, in the practice. Okay. Um, on the, like on, on a lower molar, how do you decide when to use, say, a cow horn versus like a universal lower physics forceps? Um, you know, um, in, in that, that's a great question too. So mandibular teeth, the, the, the bone, you know, is type two bone, it's, it's, it's dense. So taking a mandibular molar tooth out is more challenging. It's, it's harder than a maxillary molar, which is more is surrounded by more trabecular bone. So it depends on the di divergence of the root and the furcation that's there. Um, oftentimes to do this atraumatic or minimally traumatic extraction, meaning uh, atraumatic to the hard tissue and atraumatic to me and to the patient, with mandibular molars, I, I will often section it and take it out, take the roots out, um, the mesial and distal root out as if they were two single, single rooted bicuspid teeth. Um, but if there's a large furcation, then a cow horn works really well. Okay. Uh, I think this is one of the first slides you show. What was the initial material placed in the maxillary implant site? So it was a thin white material. Oh, that was a, the, a, a membrane that was kind of, um, cause I was lifting the, I was doing a tenting of the sinus and I just put, um, uh, the resorbable membrane from, from golden dent and I cut it like a little circle and I just kind of popped it up in there to, to like a parachute to act like a parachute uh, just to kind of protect that sinus floor. Okay. Speaking about the sinus floor, what would cause the sinus floor to drop in pneumatization, you know, after preservation bone graft or, you know, after an extraction? Yeah, it's because it's there's no support there. It's like that, that tent pole holding up a circus tent. You know, it's, it's just a physiologic reaction. And we see it all the time, right? We, the reason we don't put implants in the posterior maxilla is because the sinuses are so large. So trying to prevent that uh, from happening or minimize it is, is an important part of implant dentistry today. Okay. Um, I'm trying to say, I think I understand this question. Have you seen better results with soaked osteogen plug in, in one PRF? I'm not sure exactly if I got that right. You well, know, you know, I, I, I would put, you know, it, it absorbs blood really well. I, I love PRF. You know, I, I, I um, um, use it. I don't, I don't make a, a point of it, you know, because our procedures are, 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 are pretty, pretty simple, you know, at least simple for us. So it's, you know, de depending, I, I'll use PRF in, in my bigger cases, my sedation cases, um, where I, where I uh, you know, I'm doing more invasive uh, work, but as a routine extraction on the two cases that I showed today, um, I, I, it's not necessary. Okay. Um, are there circumstances where you would place an abutment for like, for, you know, primary stage surgery as opposed to cover screw, which has to be exposed later on? Well, cover screw, yeah, the, the literature is, is pretty clear. If we're able to get 20, at least 25 newton centimeters of initial torque of our implant, and remember our initial stability is from the apical two millimeters, 
then um, I will put a healing abutment. And a healing abutment is just, it eliminates the need for um, uncovering of the implant down the road. So, it, and it starts to train the tissue. Um, and so I, I love putting healing abutments, but it's, if it's an area that is going to be bothersome to the patient's tongue um, or in the posterior maxilla, that, that trabecular bone is still soft. I just don't want any pressure on that at all, you know, because patients are going to eat nuts and hard food. And, and if that implant moves at all, it, it's not going to integrate uh, the way we expect it to. So uh, 25 newton centimeters or less, a cover screw. 25 newton centimeters of initial torque of the implant, uh, healing abutment as long as it, it's an area of the mouth that's not going to be bothersome to the patient. Okay. Um, you touched on this with the upper first molar infected case. Uh, if the infection is overlapping with the sinus floor on the x-ray, how do you go about deciding how aggressive to be with removing granulation tissue without risking perforating the sinus? Because both feel kind of soft when you're curating up there. Absolutely. And, and you don't need to be overly aggressive. If, if a, a small amount of granulation, which you're probably going to leave there, is not going to be an issue. Because like as I said with the, the hangnail uh, analogy that I made, once you eliminate the source of the infection, the, the, the fracture tooth, whatever, the body is going to heal. Um, and it heals pretty quickly quickly uh, in that area. Okay. Um, how, how often, or, you know, is this something that, you know, what, what would cause there to be a, like a fracture of the root with the physics forceps? Um, it, it's actually, I, you're not going to fracture the root with the physics forceps. What, what you're concerned about is fracturing the facial plate. That We see that a lot with our conventional extraction techniques because we're putting so much pressure. Taking teeth out is hard. You know, and, 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 you know, I like to say we all have a myriad of extraction instruments in our practice. Why? Because it's hard. And we, we're always looking for the next best tool to make our, our job uh, easier or, or more proficient. And the physics forcep, again, is not a forcep. You're not putting pressure um, on it. You're using, you're using leverage. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a class one lever. Uh, they say the, the pyramids were built on, with class one levers. And so it's it's creating a physiologic um, evulsion of the tooth of the tooth out of the socket. So I you don't you're not going to fracture the root necessarily. Uh, and we if you don't use a lot of pressure, you're going to maintain that facial plate of bone as the tooth uh, extrudes up and out of the socket uh, during the procedure. Okay. Uh, what about the order? You know, when, will you place an osteogen plug first when doing an immediate implant, and and then place the implant? through the osteotomy, including the plug, or yeah, what's no, your order of event? Yeah, to show that, um, and maybe you can invite me back and we can do a whole program on immediate implants. Okay, but you're welcome, yeah, you're, love, you're invited I, back. I love, um, <laughs> very easy to, <laughs> it's very easy to thread um, an implant into an osteogen plug. So you, you extract the tooth, you have a socket, put a plug in and you can, uh, you do your osteotomy, then put the plug in and then thread your implant directly into it. And it'll, it'll it's like caulking, right? It fills the void. Uh, very, very nicely. Great question. Okay. Very, very, yep, astute. Yep. Uh, missing buckle plate, either through extraction or that's just the defect. What's the best way to deal with that? So, you know, again, if you have a facial plate missing, that's where I will go to an allograft material, uh, the golden uh, dent, uh, allograft material, and I will reflect the area um, so that you can see the defect completely. You then have to protect the uh, you have to protect the allograft from invagination of epithelium. So that membrane must be extended be at least two millimeters beyond the defect. So let's say we have an eight millimeter facial defect. I have to reflect it, the tissue, and place that membrane at least 10 millimeters um, down into that, that area uh, to protect that allograft from invagination of epithelium. And that, in, that membrane has to be pl placed passively so that it stays in place for at least six weeks. If it comes out before then, that's when things become unpredictable. Okay. Uh, any particular osteotomes that you recommend for sinus bump or lift? Uh, you know, that you, you can get osteotomes all over the place. Uh, there's autotomes from Salvin. Most of the implant companies today have their specific osteotomes for their specific design of implants. And that, that's probably what I would, would recommend is Rather than buying a generic one, buy one specific to the system that you like to use. Okay. 
Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, this is, I'll, I'll read through this. It's a little bit long. I opened a flap today after bone grafting, which was FDBA done four months ago on number 13. It had a buckle four millimeter defect, uh, used a pericardial membrane. There was soft tissue in the implant site. How do you manage such a case? See, that's, that's the issue. So um, that's technique. Um, you, you have to curette the whole thing out and start over. No way to fix that. It's okay, start from scratch. Yeah, it's happened to all of us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Preparing the, the socket for the graft, is it necessary to uh, remove the PDL completely? Is it necessary to remove the PDL completely? So, so I, I, um, I, I aggressively curette the walls. You want bleeding. Um, you, you want bleeding to the site before any graft is placed, whether it be an allograft or a alloplastic material. Um, so, I guess the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> okay. What can you do to to encourage bleeding there? Uh, do you, do you like use like some some type of perforation of the socket bone yeah, to increase exactly. bleeding? Use the round burr, you know, use uh, you know the burrs that that Kirch uh, demonstrated his little kit um, that that is provided, you know, to roughen up the surface. You you, you have you know a dry socket is not going to heal, right? We all know that. So you have to have bleeding uh, to the site to get the the um, regeneration process to begin. Okay. Uh, are there cases uh, where an oxygen plug is contraindicated? Again, if the facial, in my opinion, and we're doing research on this right now, for, for those in the audience uh, or that are listening to us today, if the facial defect is there, I would prefer to use an allograft with a membrane. However, we are starting to, to, to do our studies. Uh, there's osteogen sheets. We're using that as the membrane and we're evaluating those sites for bone. That's why it was important, uh, Lauren, that when, when I did the procedure to, to reflect that area so that you could actually see that was bone, okay? I, I wasn't making it up, you could see it. And, the, and doing the histology is important. The magenta color, it, we're getting actual bone um, uh, formation in that socket site. Okay. What about uh, you? Know, you, un you uncover an implant, or an, you know, down the road, uh, you see an implant that's lost bone. Can you use the, you know, the bone grafts for that, or what's the best way to deal with uh, yeah, you know, an implant that's lost? It's a, that's, that's a whole other topic too. The treatment of the failing ailing implant, and, and I like to say, you know, I've been doing this for 36 years. Every 10 years, that becomes a, a popular topic. Lauren, you probably discussed it at some point. Trying trying to repair bone around an implant, trying to get crestal height, is nearly impossible. You know, and I know, I know Dr. Gordon Christensen will say, you know, if it's asymptomatic and a little bit of bone loss, um, is, as long as the tooth is functional and aesthetic and the patient it doesn't bother them, you know, leave it alone. Trying, trying to repair it is, is a real challenge for us. And I don't think there's any, any predictable way of, of, of getting height around an implant, circumferentially around an implant. Okay. Uh... Let's see here. Can I use oxygen with a membrane on a facial defect? Yes. Okay. What about cutting up the, the plug? Can you do that? Like do it in multiple pieces and pack it into like a narrow socket? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> well, yeah, these are insightful questions. These are phenomenal. Okay. Uh, can you please comment on the different applications for osteotape versus osteoplug um, and quickly just give uh, an advantage of epi guide? Okay, it's, it's the same material. It's the same material. Um, it's just for different indications. A sheet would be more like a membrane type of thing where, where you wanted to try to, to help build a wall or, or defect uh, that we're just starting to use now, but it's exactly the same material. You could take a sheet and roll it up and make it into a, a plug. Uh, EpiGuide is a synthetic uh, tri-layered material um, that is uh, synthetic, it, it, wonderful material. Um, the, the, the only challenging part with it is it's, it's two-sided. Um, so you have to be conscious of, of which side you use towards the bone and which side is towards the epithelium. Uh, but it's a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful synthetic material, uh, not, not made from, from animal products. 
Now, it lasts longer, right? So do you still need primary closure if you're using EpiGuide? No, you, don't, you don't need primary closure. Remember, epithelium is going to grow a half a millimeter to a millimeter. I, I'm more worried about attached gingiva than primary closure. Um, uh, but you just have to, you know, if you're using an allograft, you must protect that allograft from invagination of epithelium. So you must use a membrane. With, with okay. osteogen, you don't because of the consistency of the, of the material. Um, what about dry socket? What would cause it and what's the way, best way to deal with it? But, you know, dry socket is, is again, uh, the way the body heals, you get blood, you form a clot, it, it heals from the apex towards the crest. That's physiologic. If the clot is eliminated, you have what's called a dry socket, and it's not going to heal and it can be very painful uh, to the site. Um, and so, um, you know, there's different, different materials that we use. You know, when we do third molar uh, extractions, um, there's different, different products to kind of hold that clot in the place and then suturing is very, very important. And post-operative instructions, no smoking, no spitting, no straws. You gotta maintain that, that, that blood clot. Okay. Um, someone was saying that when they use the physics forceps in the lower molars, they find it a little difficult to place it in the, the buccal vestibule. Any uh, placement uh, tips that you can uh, offer yeah, them? You know, again, mandibular molars, I'll section those and take them out as two individual single rooted teeth. Um, and you don't need the bumper necessarily. If you take the bumper off, because you're not putting a lot of pressure, uh, that'll allow you to get down into the vestibule a little bit deeper. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question exactly, but I'll read this. Um, looking at research from facial aesthetics, the enzyme takes seven to 10 days to work, not 60 seconds. What is, is, what, what's your experience with that? I'm not sure which enzyme specifically that he's mentioning. I am not sure how to how to answer that. And you know the experience, you know, uh, clinically, you're putting tension on the root of the tooth, and within less than a minute, that tooth is going to disengage up and out of the socket because the periodontal ligament is released. That's the only thing that's holding that tooth in place is the periodontal ligament. Okay. Um, that's okay. Now for for sectioning teeth, have you? What are you using? Can you use a pesiotome, or are you just using a burr? Yeah, you know, I, yeah, I'll, I'll use a piezo or I'll use a, uh, most of the time I'll just use a, a 557 surgical burr, you know, long surgical burr on my, on my electric handpiece. Okay. For the uh, membrane, do you find that you typically have to secure it with some like periosteal sutures, uh, you know, or, or how, you know, how often do you need to, I guess, to, to secure Again, it? And is what, it the necessary? next webinar, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on that. We kind of ran out of time here. Again, the membrane, I don't use a lot of tax or anything, Lauren. Um, my reflection is like an envelope, uh, like a number 10 envelope if you blow into it. So I don't make vertical incisions. So closure, it goes back into position. It's like if you had, you had a number 10 envelope and you fill it with some pennies and you can close it, it's kind of kind of wider. Um, but my membrane is always passively placed. So you have to extend the reflection beyond the defect and the membrane is passively placed beyond that defect both facially and lingually or, lingually or palatally. Um, it, and, and you know it's there. Again, as, as general dentists, including myself, um, we have a tendency to wanna to force the membrane into position. We push and push and push and tear and rip, and we're not really passively placing that membrane, which means that it could come out. The patient could pull it out. Um, when, when the sutures are removed, it could be pulled out. If the membrane is not remained intact for at least six weeks, in my experience, the case becomes unpredictable. Not that it okay. won't work, but it becomes unpredictable. Um, can you place the graft material first and then place the plug over it with no membrane? Yes. Okay. And last question, believe it or not, do you have any presentations coming up in Michigan about immediate implant placement? We're doing, um, um, you know, we, I, I do my programs through Glidewell Lab. Uh, I'll be in Newport Beach uh, and we'll be in New Jersey. And next year uh, we are doing a program in Michigan. I don't know the dates yet, but if you go to Glidewell Lab, um, that, that information should be available. Great. Well, we're at the bottom of the hour and we're, I got to all the questions. So uh, anything you'd like to say before we wrap it up for the night? Uh, I, I just really appreciate your invitation, Lauren. You're, you're a great host and I really, I really enjoy you. You make me smile. Uh, I really appreciate it and, and, and Kurt for inviting me. And this is important stuff for, for a general dentist. Uh, as general dentists, 
uh, we need to promote ourselves and get as much education as possible. And, and uh, God bless and be safe. Stay healthy, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Well, thank you for the kind comments, Tim. We, we love having you on here. Uh, we, you know, it's, it goes without saying that, you know, I do webinars for other companies. We have other speakers. Nobody packs them in the way you do. Uh, we're consistently, you know, close to a thousand people, or if not more, for, for your webinars. Uh, one of the things I, I love about your, your content is that it's always new and fresh. Uh, you know, there are some speakers out there, as we all know, who, you know, if you saw this, if you saw their lecture 10 years ago, you, <laughs> you, you saw what it is like today. They, they haven't updated the slides at all. Um, but this is, this is great content. Um, as I mentioned, uh, just as a, a final housekeeping thing, the uh, recording will go out sometime in the next uh, day or two. CE certificates typically take about a week or two. Nothing you need to do when you log out. You're done. Uh, as long as you're here, you'll get the CE. Um, as always, thanks to Golden Dent for their sponsorship, for, for inviting Dr. Kaczynski to, to join us, for handling the CE and all the stuff that goes into creating a, a webinar. Um, this is a really fantastic special. Every time that they seem to outdo themselves with their specials, 13% is pretty significant. I would highly recommend that you take advantage of that. And uh, we've had, uh, you know, great, a lot of my clients are, are Golden Dent uh, customers and have rave about their products. They've got a great return policy, although I'm not sure if any of our clients have ever returned anything. But um, they stand by, by what, they, what they create, and uh, I would highly uh, recommend that you take advantage of this. So we know that all of your time is valuable. We thank you for joining us. As you know, we do these webinars on a regular basis. All of you who are here this, this evening are going to be sent uh, invitations for future webinars, and we hope to see you all then. So uh, as Tim said, please stay safe and healthy, and we look forward to seeing you all on future webinars. Good night, everyone. Good night.